we warmly welcome you back to Think Wise Human Humane Architecture. This is the 271st uh, episode. And thanks to you, Eric, you're going to show us uh, which accumulated viewer you are. Yes, today. Martin. Uh, Humane Architecture is up to 14,620 views. All right, and we is our tripartite team here, comprised of two of us from our main island in uh, uh, Oahu, Honolulu, Hawaii, the city, and that's you, DeSoto, in your Bishop Museum. Hi, DeSoto. Good morning, everybody, or good day, everyone. And that's me in the Waikiki Grand, and uh, from our mainland which is the festland as we call it in german and i never reflected on that matt because that's you matt noblet back uh in your i was about to say detroit michigan now i'm getting uh, confused <laughs> right in boston <laughs> massachusetts because you're always all over the place welcome no, back man no i'm in boston <laughs> all right and you met our boston banish booster that some of us think we might urgently need here <laughs> uh, back in Honolulu. So let's get the first slide up. And as promised, we're only going to have one slide of the weekly architectural criticism. This gets us back to our kakaako that we uh, stopped with uh, last week. And we see an aerial view, bird's eye view of the same thing at the top left, which uh, I'm going to conclude my observation from last week doesn't make it better. It still or increasingly reminds me of the Stalin Allee slash Karl Marx Allee called now by uh, Henselmann, the architect back in these GDR days with his big boulevard and some rather frightening uh, Einschüchtern is the German word, makes you feel little uh, human scale in between. And I mean, that's that's my, uh, as of now, observation. And we promised, again, you guys will, because as fair as you are, say, don't judge, judge a book by the cover, but we got a closer cover page of the first architecture that they're unveiling, and that's by Kamehameha School. And that is in this aerial view at the bottom right of the Render it in green, you go figure uh, animation there, and uh, it's uh, then shown as a uh, rendering at the bottom left. We also threw in some numbers here and some analogies to uh, what the Soto, you and I, whenever we get tired about architecture, and when we see stuff like that, that happens a lot, increasingly, we take a break, um, our little yoga, relaxing, decompressing is going to vehicles to mobility, comparing it to immobility, which is buildings. And here's the comparison. And I, we talked about uh, that our island seems to be dominated by Camrys and Corollas, as that supposedly were free, free cars. They're pretty nondescript. And Toyota decides to over to redo their style every other year to adjust it to the newest trends and supposedly demand and taste of the customer, uh, and they become so much the same. They look all little different, but not really much, right? In architecture, we said they have an undercut here or there, but they're pretty much of the same species. Yeah, and thanks, Eric. And I crossed out the, because this is not a Corolla or a Camry, this is a Prius, which is generally the better direction electric, but these buildings don't even have the equivalent of an electric engine in there, right? Because they're still fossil fueled. So what I'm missing is next to it to the left, when the Honda Insight came out, which is the one on the very left, that was at least showing you, okay, I'm sort of different. I'm streamlined. I might have a new technology under my, under my body. And so, uh, yeah, the architecture doesn't do that. And remembering the soda you read to us last time, what word bitch they use and which word, and one was one princess. I think that's the building sort of in the, in the back of their rendering at the bottom left, and the one at the front is their torch. So That's right. Yeah. I mean, what again, what does this have to do with the problems? We just got Senator Cheng's timely newsletter. I glimpsed through it. It's all the, the major headline is like, although sales have fallen, prices are still up. So how is this helping us? And we put the price tag here, right? We have 
from their website studios are around 300,000, one bedroom, 500, two bedroom, 600, three bedroom, 700. That might be like, okay, some say, okay, I can secure, you know, uh, myself a unit and then I'm safe. But it's, it's like with the Corollas, right? And with, with the Camrys, I'm, I'm sort of free, right? Because I'm still stuck in traffic. I'm still having high, you know, uh, gas, uh, you know, builds. I'm still having high AC. So it's kind of a sort of a, a worry-free. Is that, I mean, I leave it with that from, from my side. Oh, one more thing, the show quote at the, at the center then is, is the project on state land right next to it or behind it. And so one is Kamehameha School, the other one is State, and they're both like your 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 legacy, the Soda, right? So I'm I'm uh, hopefully enough provocation to to get out of you what you think about it, and you met as well, please. Uh, well, I as I said last week, um, there there's a difference between a very grand open space and a small cozy space, and you did just mention earlier very large open spaces in some cases feel exhilarating and freeing, but in other cases, you feel small and insignificant, and they are difficult to traverse because they're large paved expanses. So what is going to happen between these buildings? Is it going to be another Stalin Allee, as in East Berlin, or is it going to be something more livable or something more desirable or something that's more attractive to make you want to go there? We're just going to have to wait and see. But I also did want to add, too, when you were talking about uh, buying into this and you're now free because you have your condo and you have your Corolla or your, your Toyota in general, you've also got monthly condo fees that are not insignificant. So it's not as though you're off the hook. Once you've paid for your condo, you will pay forever for your condo. So, yeah. As you have when you buy your new car, you likely have car are payments right yep that's right they end you do come to an end uh theoretically but uh you'll never stop paying your condo association fee yeah and that's like the cultural side there's also a climatic side and you know i mean the the Karl marx allee as they more correctly i guess try and call it the former stalin allee right um, right now we're heading winter again, right? So what we, you know, what there was a little relief, if you can even say so, because in war there is no such thing as relief. But at least, you know, you didn't have to worry about being, you know, killed by, by weapons. You didn't have to worry about killed by a frostbite, which is coming now in the Ukraine again. So buildings that still have fenestrations at least, you know, keep you keep you from that. But that is the architecture is wall architecture that we don't need here. And a torch, you know, might come in handy over there because it keeps you warm. But I have no idea. I can only imagine and I'm really scared to have these met or most traumatizing us postmodern, uh, us being the children of the end of postmodern architectural education, that what they think this has to do with a torch is the top of it, where it's sort of like getting lighter. And that's what where the flame happens. But the soda, this reminds us of. Uh, this is Stanford Carr, by the way. He's building pretty close to that where it wears this Kamehameha like top thing <clears throat> that does nothing else but covering AC. So this is like the worst postmodernism that you know should have been over about half a century ago, I believe. Okay. Well, there we let's, are. Let's maybe turn <laughs> from the dark to the bright because the second part of this page here gets us our spirit back up. Because there's a car I use to refer to your guys' architecture, Matt, which is the Aptera, which uh, is shooting for what Musk, we believe, uh, conveniently was not doing, shooting as far as to say, I want to make a car that never has to see, not even an electric charging station. And that's what the Aptera tries to shoot for. So this is driven by performance, which you guys do, and then it generates a form. And that sort of is, uh, that form is pleasant. Uh, because it's derived by by natural forces, and so is the architecture. Again, top right, an example because we don't want to compare, you know, uh, apples with oranges because we're in residential architecture. The gen sign that we're going to reconnect to is a is an office building. But top right is your Marco Polo Tower, that uh, you know your former 
partner, uh, Martin Haas, invited me to see, and um, uh, we checked out under construction, obviously. And you might now say, um, okay, this is, this is uh, I put the, in all fairness, the price text there too, and it's, it's even more expensive. It's high end is luxury, which the other one doesn't claim, doesn't even claim. It says it's for the workforce. So this is more for the ones who have made it. But I have to say, and I should have quoted, and you guys should look it up, even on Realtors' website, they really sell it uh, not just by uh, surface, by substance, and by biochromatic substance. You really get something for the buck. And for example, to make us jealous, you get an awesome uh, lanai all the way across it that you know you can use for the few months of summer when it's nice and the little bit of spring and, and fall, which you know that is what the torch should be. The torch should be that. So I would almost like to switch that, although I don't want to, <laughs> you know, smother my nice neighboring, you know, big city from my away from my hometown of Hanover. Because even, you know, there, I don't want to see that torch. That torch is just <laughs> but ugly, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> so anyways, what else do you have to chip in now, Matt, that I provoke you with this analogy of a Terra and the Marco Polo Tower? Um, no, it's interesting. I mean, uh, Marco Polo is also interesting because really every one of those, those balconies or those lanais are unique um, at, a, at each floor. So... Um, I mean, this was obviously targeting a very, a rather high end. At one point, those were the most expensive uh, apartments in Europe. But, um, but for that, I think you also you got a very. There was a unique experience, you know, spatially associated with each unit. Um, it did have a rather friendly, a rather friendly posture towards the climate in terms of um natural ventilation possibility i mean all of the glass walls open up you could kind of naturally ventilate the unit it did have uh cooling for the summer months but it was a solar powered cooling system uh from the roof so um also you know relatively sustainable for those spaces that needed it um it's a different approach right it's just a fundamentally different way of of, of approaching yeah. a building project and I and I think in all fairness I we should <clears throat> compare it and we can still do this in the in the future to dedicate the slide to it. I think the, the the one pairing it to and comparing it to is the Anaha by Howard Hughes in Kakaako because that's exactly the same market. This is high-end residential and they both have funky, fancy forms, right? Mm -hmm. They're both sort of hula dancing, swoopy, curvy. <laughs> the big difference is one is driven by performance, by bioclimatic performance. That is the Marco Polo Tower. The other is driven by surfacial extravaganza, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with a high price tag of hermetic fossil fueled thousands of dollars you have to spend for burning fossil fuel to keep it cool inside. And add that to it, right? We all know that and remind the generation that and at the end of its life cycle, the building, the the uh, the 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 resulting building cost is eight times as much as the initial erection cost, and that is due to maintenance and heating and cooling. So you know Marco Polo gets cheaper over time because of the natural mm -hmm. systems, mm -hmm. and Anaha gets more expensive. That's mm -hmm. that's the additional tragedy of that. Let me ask a question as a lay person. <clears throat> That may be stupid, but uh, it's it's relevant. If you are constructing a building, is it cheaper to make everything the same? Now, consider, say it's poured in place concrete. You're going to have to pay, create the forms for every one of the concrete pours that you do. Is it actually more expensive to create, as you just said, Matt, a different concrete pour on every floor because all of them are different? Is there actually a difference in cost? And if so, why? Because you're just doing the same amount of work, right? It's a complicated question. I think um, in the case of Marco Polo, the, the balustrades on the outside, the, to pour the slabs in a different shape, I mean, they have to go up there and build them anyway. So I would say that's negligible. Um, the, the balustrades are precast concrete, which uh, we actually kind of figured out a system to reuse shapes by rotating them and you know shifting them around so that the overall impression as you go around the building is one of variation but it's all made up of rather systematic kind of pieces and parts 
Um, but no, I mean, I definitely we're in a different place than we were 20, 20 years ago with, uh, computerized fabrication. You know, it used to be that a guy had to go out or a woman had to go out and lay out a whole jig for each individual shape that you wanted to build. And now you send basically a, a roboticized, uh, plasma cutter, you know, out and it, and it does whatever you want it to do. It doesn't really, it doesn't care whether it goes left or right or up or down. Yeah, and, and just to further prove to Silver that this was, as always, a very smart question, I referred to that last piece that we haven't talked about that traces back to a discussion we had before with, with you, Matt, that you said, why aren't there nothing but um, um, electric vehicles on this island? Because nowhere are the conditions as ideal for it. And I say, why aren't there are only convertibles? And you put the two together, you know, every nature has its beasts. And so here, this article, which I read, I found interesting, was the fact that there aren't very many electric uh, fueled uh, convertibles is because the battery is heavy and at the middle and supposedly below the passenger or the driver. So in case of a flipping over, which you just so do have mm -hmm. You know, experience, experience. experience, having been on the Star of the Tides title page with your Beetle from way back, uh, then this battery could crush you. But at the same time, this is less likely to happen because your gravity point is lower because mm -hmm. there's more weight on that car. So it kind of goes both ways. But again, this is like if you're thinking, as you like to say, this sort of out of the box, which is here literally and figuratively speaking with the Aptera. You know, you got pros and cons, but that's what evolution is about, right? I mean, we're now shooting people back on the moon, right? Although we had some tragic experiences, right? We're, we're still doing it because there might be, you know, it might be worth it. There might be more to discover. So you're still, you're taking up the risk. Okay, so um, that being said, and again, um, while your Gensheim building, next slide, is in another uh, climate zone and another culture, but we want to remind the audience that the principles of bioclimatic designs are universal. You then just have to adjust that to the very specificities of where you are. And this is a temperate climate. So we're kicking back in what we've been talking about last time. And um, I always say to the emerging generation, and that's only true for innovative architecture, for reactionary not. Because I say, if there's one drawing you should choose, if you can only choose one drawing, I always suggest the section. But if it's like a Stalin uh, yeah. double loaded corridor, that's as boring, you know, in section as it is in plan <laughs> and in reality. But with really cool, literally and figuratively speaking, architecture, you know, that's that is why you guys are so high on sections, right, Matt? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I think also from a, the, perspe the perspective of understanding the sustainable qualities of the space, you know, the section is always a very informative drawing. It tells you, you know, kind of how, because a lot of those, a lot of the things that we're concerned with light and, and air movement are deeply dependent on the kind of vertical uh, aspect of the building. So, yeah. So explain us what we see. Please. So these are just some these are some um, rather early um, kind of almost collages uh, on the on the right and more of a kind of a hand sketch on the left of this internal atrium, which really evolved because the master plan uh, for the area that this building was was built in in Kendall Square in, in uh, Cambridge here in Boston was uh, extraordinarily deep floor plates. I mean, most developers in Boston and on the East Coast insist on you know floor plates that are no less than about 40,000 square feet which is a massive amount of uh horizontal area to be able to daylight uh or naturally ventilate if that's what you're trying to do and so what we proposed here was to kind of punch a hole through the middle of that uh and add a couple of stories on top of the building in order to replace the lost square footage with the goal being to drive uh natural daylight down through the center of this building using as many uh, techniques as we knew how to use. So one of them is the actual dimensional uh, characteristic of the space. Uh, another are the heliostats that are mounted on the roof, which are basically sun tracking mirrors that reflect the light down. Uh, there's, a, there's a sun tracking mirror that reflects the light to a fixed mirror, which then reflects it down into the space. Uh, and then within the space itself, there, there are vertical lamella that rotate uh, and sort of animate the light at every floor, uh, flanking the, the elevator shaft. 
there are lighting fixtures uh, that are or, uh, configured in such a way as to sort of also, they have a kind of a reflective component that works also with the daylight. Uh, and then there's this chandelier in the middle, which kind of animates the whole thing, this prismatic chandelier, which kind of turns the whole thing into a very dynamic experience. So the goal here was really to try to, was was really a reaction against a poor planning decision relative to the sort of the building dimensions uh, and to show what you, you know, what, how you could manage a, a building with that, those kind of perimeter dimensions. And I just want to add that this is, as I said before, actually a very old technique that was developed uh, for modern buildings of the late 1800s and the 1890s. <laughs> And uh, Bishop Museum's Hawaiian Hall uses this exact same technique, not because of, uh, well, more by necessity, because they didn't have electricity yet. So the only way you could light interiors was by opening up the center in an atrium and then putting in skylights and windows. Yeah. So it's, it's not a new thing, even though no. it seems new, it's not. No, yeah. and a lot of, I mean, to your point, DeSoto, a lot of the things that we advocate for today and that we sort of try to get people to pay attention to uh, are really, as you said, they're not new ideas. The only the problem is that um, technology, building technology, has basically allowed us to ignore things that we knew intuitively many years ago, right? So, right. cheap energy has allowed us to basically overcool or just to cool buildings without really having to pay attention to how much uh, to, to natural vent ventilation, electric lighting, uh, and you know all of the bells and whistles that come with that allow us to ignore daylight. Um, but all of those come with a huge energy penalty that we haven't ever really had to pay for yet. Yeah. And listening to you, this could mean like, OK, I go back to the cave. I go, go back to the good old principles and I abandon technology at all. But you guys don't do. You do the opposite. You're saying we're embracing technology of our times, the most innovative ones, which is not fossil. Fossil actually has never really been innovative. Um, and so we're and go to the next slide for that. We're really embracing the best of these days as these heliostats here that we see there. They're really high tech and they are legitimate because they help us to save energy uh, overall. And that's why high tech is very legitimate in this case here. And again, Boston is just like in Germany, cold winters, you know, dark, long days where really you need um, you know, you need natural daylight to thrive. I would say also that the technology, though, in our cases, um, it's it's not it, it comes after the first principles. Right. I think we don't we're not really interested in technology for technology's sake. But, you know, something like this is only augmenting a building that would already be, be I think, more inhabitable than, uh, you know, a business as usual uh, kind of kind of office yeah. floor plate. Yeah. Matt, how do they work? Explain just basically how they how they work. So the, if you look at the that kind of sectional diagram right there, yeah, you see these kind of this is now this is just architects drawing stuff, but I mean conceptually, those yellow stripes coming in from the upper right down to the lower left are hitting those mirrors. Those are the tracking mirrors there, and so those are positioned and they rotate in in around the, their vertical axis and also you know to the, relative to the plane of the Earth. Uh, and they're programmed to basically track the sun. So they, you know, we know exactly where the sun is going to be at every hour of every day of every year. Uh, and so they simply rotate and they catch the sun at an angle, which allows them to then re uh, reflect that light over to on the right hand side, that fixed mirror, which is the one that's kind of angled downwards. Uh, and then that reflects the light down angle of incidence equals angle of uh, reflection, right? So that 90 degree bend then in the light, if off the second mirror goes through the skylights and then into the building. And during the summer, do they do they not function? Do you turn them away or do you want the light coming in regardless? And does that cause more heat? Uh, you do. I mean, there is a concern there. Uh, you, you don't. I mean, I think it would be worse if it's direct light, since this is reflected light. Um, you're already I mean, there's a sort of a, a degradation of the, the, the radiant energy. But um, there is a, I mean, there is a, there are filters. You can see these kind of um, uh, mat or these kind of, this is kind of a glass tile that can be rotated shut to just filter that light and knock down some of the, uh, any, any of the heat energy. But since this is a very tall space, most of that heat, heat energy gets kind of trapped in the upper part of the, the building, uh, the upper, upper part of the atrium above those glass tiles. 
and can be evacuated out without making it uncomfortable for people for people inside the building. Yeah, heading towards the end of another exciting 28 minutes, still give us the next slide, <laughs> which illustrates why in the world would this have would be interesting for us in Hawaii, uh, so far away, such a different, because again, you need to go out in the world, understand, experience different climate zones. And this is what these two young gentlemen who are recent graduates of our school, Chris and Siraj have been doing. They were part of the Copenhagen Exchange and they came over to Hanover and check out, met your guys' project there. Uh, and um, there you go. And again, with the cars, we drove there with our old little Twingo and then they were excited <laughs> to see the evolution of that, which is the Twitzy. The Twingo is, is, an, is a fossil car, but a very fuel efficient one, but then Renault went the next step to go to an all electric car. And uh, a reference, which we made before the photo at the top right, uh, there is this island, another volcanic island as part of the Canarian Islands, where we had a big eruption, uh, similar to the ones on the big island recently. And we periodically reflect on that. The difference is that this island made itself off the grid, with hydroelectric power, high tech, as we're talking about, and you know, favoring a post fossil life, and they only allow electric cars on the island. Uh, hmm. uh, you know, predominantly the Twitzy. And next slide, which we want to end on saying hi from Joey and Clara, who had just been in Bali and pretty much said, Oh my God, this is as screwed up as in Hawaii with all this traffic, <sighs> all this consumption, consumerism. And they escape to these Gili Islands, which are between Lombok and Bali. And here you go. It's car free. It's bicycle based and it works. And people then will say, I already hear them. will say, well, that, that only works on that small scale. No, sorry. I just said where Siraj and Chris were is Copenhagen. That is not small. That is big, as big as Honolulu. And it works there, too. Mm -hmm. So with that, we're at the end of the show. This was, by the way, our Thanksgiving show. So I'll be thankful for being able to give and uh, see you next week. And until then, please stay a reciprocal altruist. <laughs> <laughs> see us all. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.